It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Batman Galidge. Dr. Batman Galidge is a formally trained medical doctor who received his medical education and training at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School of London University. He has spent most of his scientific life researching the link between pain and disease and chronic dehydration. He discovered the healing powers of water 21 years ago when he was serving time as a political prisoner in an Iranian jail. And he successfully treated 3,000 fellow prisoners suffering from stress-induced peptic ulcer disease with the only medication he possessed, water. This is when he understood for the first time in medical history that the body indicates its water so shortage by producing pain. Since his prison experience, he has focused his full time and attention on dehydration produced health problems in the body. His discovery has helped hundreds of thousands of people suffering from a variety of pains and degenerative diseases regain their health. Dr. Batman Galege has presented his findings at several international and world conferences, and they have been published and peer-reviewed in a number of scientific journals. His findings are now available to the public in an easy-to-understand form in his four books, and his videotapes and audio tapes of his lectures plus combination programs. These health education materials have been peer and media reviewed and acclaimed both nationally and internationally. He is the author of four books, and they are Your Body's Many Cries for Water, How to Deal with Back Pain and Rheumatoid Joint Pain, Water, Prescription for a Healthier Pain-Free Life, and ABC of Asthma, Allergies, and Lupus. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Batman Glitch. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Patel, it gives me a pleasure to be here and present to you uh, once again my view or my discovery that chronic unintentional dehydration is the primary cause of pain and disease, including cancer, in the human body. As you know, I discovered this uh, pain-relieving property of water in a stressful environment, in a human laboratory, stress laboratory called Evin Prison, where people were involved, not animals or rats. They had tongues they could speak and they could indicate the relief, they could give out their symptoms, and one could evaluate the impact of water on their health and well-being. Evin Prison uh, will probably be remembered in throughout future history that we are going to make out of that event a significant turning point in the life of mankind, not because it, uh, the authorities there killed a lot of people, but because they produced a stressful environment where the human body could reveal its stress-induced health problems and water could reveal its magical curative properties in stress-induced health problems. We are better off as a result of uh, what they did because of this discovery than anything that was done in research of medicine for the past 100 years. Because since 100 years ago when we in medicine, my predecessors, uh, started looking at the science of medicine, the question was asked, uh, when is the body 
thirsty. A man by the name of Maurice Schiff, a Frenchman, said that thirst is a general sensation and tried to stress this issue that uh, we should look at dehydration through different perspectives in the body. Then there, there came a, a doctor by the name of Walter Bradford Cannon, an Englishman. He said, no, thirst is indicated by a dry mouth. When the mouth is dry, the body is thirsty. So we should drink water when we have a dry mouth. He was a very influential person, and the scientific community and the medical community bought into this false statement. And a hundred years of money and time has been spent following chasing this false assumption. And when we should have, a hundred years ago, learned more about impact of dehydration in the human body, we wasted a hundred years, and today at the end of, or at the dawn of the 21st century, we are beginning to understand that the dehydration manifests itself in as many ways as we in medicine have invented disease conditions. We in medicine, not knowing that dehydration becomes symptom producing and lack of water in, in the body is a pathology producing, we have labeled states of dehydration, complications of dehydration as disease conditions and most often diseases of unknown etiology, in other words, cause unknown. <clears throat> when the body has been calling for water, it has become a fixed tradition to give it medication, to give it toxic chemicals without uh, trying to stress this aspect of uh, the flaw in our thinking. I would like to get into the lecture and explain how dehydration is the cause of disease in the human body. As our famous uh, thinker of the time said, in order to solve problems, we need to up the level of thinking from the level of thought that created those problems. That is why we need to establish a paradigm shift in our mind and forget a lot of information that we were fed and we were forced to memorize in health matters and in science of medicine. 20th century medicine is based on four false assumptions. The entire monument of medicine, including this beautiful structure of Jefferson University, hospital, medical school, is based on four false assumptions. Dry mouth is the only true indicator of thirst, which it is not. In order to be able to chew and swallow food, which is a primary function for the body, we produce ample saliva, even though the rest of the body may be dehydrated. So dry mouth is not a sign of dehydration. And as I will explain, people who've just eaten a heavy meal and within half an hour they start getting heartburn, they were able to swallow that food even though they were thirsty. The second false assumption is that water has no direct metabolic impact. It has no direct chemical effect. And the body is regulated by the solutes, by, by the elements that it dissolves in itself in the human body. In fact, we thought that we've taken the science of chemistry and rammed it into the human body when we discovered that the human body is made up of the similar elements that we tested in discipline of chemistry. We assumed automatically, as we did in chemistry, that water has no role. It's substance A and substance B that are principal uh, agents in any chemical reaction. But water has no direct role in itself, which is a wrong assumption. The third false assumption is that water regu regulatory mechanisms of the body 
are efficient throughout the lifespan of a person. We begin to lose our perception of thirst as we grow older and we allow dehydration to settle in our body. So this is another false assumption. The fourth false assumption is that all fluids can replace the water needs of the body, which is wrong. Water is water. Whatever is a fluid is not necessarily acting in the body in the same capacity as water. For example, milk is not water. It is food. Caffeine in beverages has its own agenda in the human body. It dehydrates the body. Its effect on the brain and kidneys is the, uh, results in a lot of production of urine. It's going to, it's going to uh, flush more water out of, the <coughs> out of the body than there is water in the beverage. So when you drink a cup of coffee, and it's 200 cc's, your body will begin to lose at least 230, 250, depending on how dehydrated you are and how your body is trying to conserve its water content. But caffeine, the sum total of it is that it dehydrates the body. Caffeine does something else which is absolutely uh, detrimental to the health of any living matter, and that is that it inhibits the enzyme phosphodiesterase, which is essential in memory making. Dr. Patel just now was telling me that he was the, uh, one of the original discoverers of phosphodiesterase activity. And uh, well, Dr. Patel, caffeine inhibits that enzyme activity. It's been discovered in, uh, in fruit flies that uh, the fruit flies totally forget their ability to uh, fly off to the art of camouflage is lost and uh, they become easy prey to uh, whatever is about to eat them. In fact, a coffee plant is using caffeine as a chemical warfare because once any predator would eat the coffee bean which is supposed to generate the next species of the coffee plant in the soil, uh, its enzymes that will allow it to remember when to camouflage, when to, uh, to be alert, to be responsive and reactive and quick and agile, that ability will go. And that critter or whatever eats it will become prey to its own predator. And that is how the coffee plant defends itself or its next generation species. Now we take this seed, bean, extract its caffeine, concentrate it, and give it to our people in the form of coffee and strongly brewed coffee and uh, one cup of Starbucks coffee contains 180 milligrams of this poisonous material. And as you can see in the society, uh, Starbucks uh, coffee shops are mushrooming all over the place. And you can see 10 years from now how stupid <laughs> we will become by following this uh, fashion of sitting at the counter of Starbucks or any coffee shop. I'm not zeroing on Starbucks, but uh, they make the strongest coffee, so they claim anyway. <laughs> so this is a problem in our society that people don't realize. Caffeine is a stupefying element. It is designed to do that. Now, we give this caffeine to our children. Rate of consumption of caffeine-containing beverages has shot up. It is now 64 gallons per person per year. And children as young as one and a half to two years are given sodas. Older people in hospitals, instead of water, are given sodas. 
So you can imagine how our society is suffering because we don't understand the difference between fluids and water. Now, on top of caffeine, we, we are now producing uh, diet sodas which contain this uh, substance called aspartame as artificial sweetener with the false assumption that anything that doesn't have energy and is a sweet is okay because the body is only uh, storing energy that it gets in the form of sugar when, it, when we drink uh, these beverages. Well, the false assumption is that we are f not fooling the body, we are fooling our, our pockets and our health and our understanding of the human body. Because the human brain is a, a magnificent uh, computer, it calculates and computes the intensity of sweetness, and to the nearest uh, 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 energy unit, it calculates the extent of energy that is arrived by the sweetness of the element that you've swallowed. And it's been shown that up to 90 minutes after taking artif artificial sweetener, the, uh, when the sugar or the energy that was promised is nowhere to be found, there is a panic in the body, physiological panic by the brain and the liver. And the person is compelled to go and eat and make good the promise of energy that was given to the body by the sweetness or the intensity of the sweetness. It's been shown that people go and eat and eat heavily after taking uh, artificial sweetener. So all these people who carry this can of soda with them uh, in order to uh, uh, not put on weight, uh, they're actually um, doing the reverse. They are adding weight to their body. Maybe that can of soda didn't have the sugar, but the food that they will eat within 90 minutes will have ample supply of uh, fat-making elements in it. Artificial uh, sweetener, aspartame, uh, divides into aspartate, which is a, a directly a neuroactive amino acid. It doesn't have to be converted to any other element. Tryptophan has to be uh, converted to uh, serotonin and the other elements. Uh, tyrosine has to be converted to adrenaline, noradrenaline. But aspartate doesn't have to be converted to anything. It's directly active on the reproductive centers of the, of the brain. So we become vulnerable as a result of taking this uh, active element uh, by giving false starts to the reproductive system in the body. Aspartame has been uh, recognized to give seizures. I presume it is the Im impact of aspartate amino acid directly on the brain, in the gut. Aspartame divides into aspartate and phenylalanine, and, but 10% of the byproduct of metabolism in the gut is methyl alcohol and formaldehyde. So the more people drink artificial sweeteners, the more they are vulnerable to the toxicity of formaldehyde and methyl alcohol. And it has been now recognized that this element is responsible for, for a lot of retinal damage and visual impairment. So artificial sweetener is directly involved in eye problems. And the next one is that a lot of people who take this material become oversensitive to sense of smell. These are only highlights of the, the impact of this artificial sweetener. Unfortunately, this element is used in over 5,000 recipes, and we are causing a hell of a lot of damage to our body by taking this artificial sweetener. 
As a result of these false assumptions, we have created modern voodoo medicine of the 20th century. We use biohazardous chemicals to treat dehydration of the human body. No wonder that recently there were articles, you've all seen them, that these prescription medications, even though if taken according to the instructions of the physician, make more than two million people sicker and kill a few hundred thousand people every year. That is according to prescription, not how many mistakes are made in, in uh, uh, using prescription medication. We've produced a cost-intensive and cost-escalating sick care system because the system can only survive and thrive if people are sick. If they're well, if they're healthy, there is no sick care system. It'll, it'll be a health care system. Prevention will become a part of the program, not treatment. I can assure you that if we change the paradigm, and I understand dehydration as the origin of pain and disease, we can reduce the health care cost of this society by no less than 60 percent in a matter of 10, 15 years and have a much healthier nation, clearer thinking, more elevated in our thoughts and behavior. This is, this is my uh, understanding, and that's what I'm uh, mostly talking, and my writing is addressing this issue. And I, I've just come back from another book tour where I traveled 14 cities. I went before television and radio and talked my head off, but no one would listen. So, <laughs> Now, let us see what are the physiological effects of water in the body. Water has two main effects in the body. It has a life-giving effect. In other words, it doesn't perpetuate life, but it gives life. So water is vital for creation of life. Water manufactures hydroelectricity. When it rushes through the cell membrane, it turns cation pumps. It's the element that turns the pumps and does molecular exchange at the cell membrane. Water is behind that. It manufactures the energy for that function. It manufactures energy for neurotransmission through the, the nerve pathways. It's a process of hydrolysis is an energizing element, an energizing effect. The food that you eat has absolutely no energy value whatsoever unless there is water there to break it down, hydrolyze it, and energize it to be absorbed. I will show you a slide of that later. Then water is the bonding material. It's adhesive that binds the elements together and maintains the integrity of the cell membrane so that the, whatever goes inside the cell and whatever is going outside of the cell, it doesn't interfere with the functions of the cell. And things will not spill out of the cell unnecessarily because there is an integrated cell membrane. Water is responsible for that. Now, this is a research done by Philippa M. Wiggin. The source of energy for cation transport or ATP synthesis, this is energy manufacturing mechanism, lies in increase in chemical potentials with increasing hydration of small cations and polyphosphate anions in the highly structured interfacial aqueous phase of the two phosphorylated intermediates. In other words, water is responsible for bringing about ATP synthesis. Water is the source of energy. Good, I'm glad. Oh, who knew that? Who was it that knew that? Raise your hand. 
Okay. Now, also, water produces high heat of activation at the cell membrane. This is a very important information. Heat is a source of energy. You, we all know that, okay? The body has learned to use this heat generated by water when it rushes through the cell membrane and trap and bond or bind calcium molecules together. As you know, when you heat water, the calcium in the water furs on the side of the kettle. This is the property of calcium. When it sees heat, it immediately grabs its brother, another calcium molecule, and they hug each other. They, they unite and they bind. The body uses that heat in order to bind calcium atoms together. Because later on, the body also knows how to separate these brothers, calcium molecules, apart and release the ATP energy that is stored in the calcium bondage. So with this information, you all know now that your bones are primary reservoirs of energy. Dehydration will unlock this energy and release the calcium, and gradually the bone will begin to lose density. That's how osteoporosis begins. Okay? This is a very important piece of information that dehydration is background to release of energy from calcium bondage. Initially, at the endoplasmic reticulum inside the cells, and subsequently, gradually, from the bone structure. Now, you all have, have heard of ATP. Magnesium ATP is the element that needs to be broken down for its energy to be utilized. Unless there is water available to hydrolyze it, that magnesium ATP has no energy value because its energy content is only 600 kilojoule moles of energy. This is a unit of energy. But when it's hydrolyzed, it becomes almost 6,000 units of energy. So a tenfold increase in energy because of hydrolysis. And this guy here, hydrogen ion, which has 1,168 kilojoule moles of energy in each reaction, is there to be tapped into. It's available straight away. Now, the next one is water is the adhesive material. This is a cell membrane. This is a well-hydrated cell membrane. This is a dehydrated cell membrane. I designed this slide in order to explain the difference. Water, in going through this unit here, binds the top of the tuning fork, because this is an element that is a hydrophilic cap and a hydrophobic bitail. There are two, each unit has got two tails. Water binds these together. That's how stickiness of ice comes into uh, binding the cell membrane together. But immediately, once it gets into the main uh, waterway, the bilayer membrane, it becomes again another structure of water and in the process, these are hydrophobic elements begin to repel water and they create a wave sort of a thing. And in this waterway, in this moat area between the two layers is where all the chemical reactions in the cell occur. When something comes into the cell, an enzyme, it has to meet its substrate, its friend in arms in order to perform a a chemical reaction, it seeks it in this area. And these uh, hydrophobic tuning fork vibrators, which cause uh, stirring, will help it along in order to move and uh, perform the chemical reaction more efficiently. Another 
important element is that in dehydration, the feedback mechanism, which depends on this activity, is shut down. So part of the process that occurs in dehydration is that the body, once it gets engaged in a chemical activity or a stream of activity or a cascade of chemical reactions, it gets stuck on there unless there is water to hydrate the bilayer membrane and uh, allow the feedback mechanism to shut the chemical reaction off. This is something that's very important for uh, control of all hormones and physiological activity that depend on feedback mechanism. Water is vital for that function. Now, when there isn't water available, something still has to stick these things together. That's where cholesterol comes in. Traditionally, cholesterol is a clay-like material that sticks elements together. The human body or any living matter, including bacteria that don't have nucleus, produce lipids, cholesterol, to bind things together. And when bacteria go into um, inactivity and are preserved for years, that is how they've done it. They, they completely shut themselves off. Uh, and this moat-like area also gets shut off because the elements go into one another and prevent any float laterally sideways so that reactions don't take place. Now, medical science is stuck on this aspect of water. Water has life-supporting functions. They completely forgot about life-giving functions of water. We concentrated on water as a solvent, as a packing material, and a means of transport. That's why science and medicine is incomplete. And on incomplete information, we have built a tradition that takes charge of people's health and, and not do well by them. The brain is 85% water, and the rest of the body is 75% water. In fact, I have a reference here by uh, John G. Waterson, who is a physical chemist, and he's produced the role of water in cell architecture uh, and explained that a brain is 85% water. And he's explained how water gels things together, how it becomes sticky like ice. Water, when it's compressed to, to a, a thinness or thickness of 2.5 angstrom units, it becomes sticky like ice. Brain is 85% water, and it's, it's 1 50th of the total body weight, and the body is 75% water, but the brain takes priority, and that's why it allocates to itself 20% of the circulation. So brain has priority over water distribution because it has to perform physiological functions are, that are water dependent. It cannot endure dehydration, and that's why the brain becomes uh, a reactive force in the body against the rest of the tissues in order to bring to itself the primary raw materials at the expense of all the other tissues of the body. The human body is packed with uh, probably, I haven't counted them myself, but I'm told there are 100 trillion cells in the body, approximately. And each cell is a water-dependent species packed together within our skin. And we should consider our skin as the capsule of a water-dependent satellite or a space capsule of these water-dwelling species that have come on land. Each cell has a lot of receptors, whereas in, in our society we have these dishes that we use 
electromagnetic wavelengths in order to communicate between uh, people and countries and societies. The, all living matter that live in water have the same sort of receptor dishes, but they use chemical messengers, not electromagnetic, because their medium is not air, it is water. Everything has to flow and reach the destination by swimming to its receptor. And that's why each cell has got a bilayer membrane, because it has to protect itself from entry of anything that is not directly uh, impacting the physiology inside the cell. So each cell has got selective receptors, and these receptors are only sensitive to elements that concern that, the activity of that cell. There are basically two oceans of water in the body. There is one ocean of water inside the cells of the body, and then there is an ocean outside of the cells of the body. The water that we drink goes directly, replenishes the ocean inside. The salt that we take maintains some of the water outside of the cells and balances these two oceans. These two oceans have to be in balance at all times, just like the Atlantic and the Pacific, you can't let the Atlantic expand and the Pacific to dry up. The human body is just like that. You can't expand the content inside the cell of water and allow the water content outside of the cell to dry up. In fact, the reverse is true because the physiology of the human body depends that the exterior water compartment expands and the interior water carp compartment in the cells begin to shrink. And this is where health problems occur, because when water is short inside the cells, the physiology of, physiological functions of that cell don't occur more as efficiently as they should. So that's why dehydration that settles in one or another area of the body becomes symptom-producing because of malfunction of the physiology inside the cells. There are three major ways of delivering water into the cells. One is by diffusion at the rate of 10 to the power of minus 3 centimeters per second. The water goes through the cell membrane, gets into this moat area, and then eventually inside. When there isn't enough water in the body, because the human body has a lot of water, let us get something clear. We have a lot of water in our body. We are talking about free water to perform f new functions. Whatever water that we have in the body is already engaged in a physiological function. You cannot expect water to abandon its physiological function in the brain and go into the gut in order to dissolve or break down food or vice versa. We need fresh water for fresh activity. If you want to eat food, you need fresh water. You can't rely on water that is in, in the body. That water is already engaged. And if you drank a, a glass of water two hours ago, that water is probably already sitting in your bladder and it's not in your circulation. So if you're going to eat, you better give the body some more water before you eat. Now. The other way of delivering water is by reverse osmosis, because the body tends to draw water out of the peripheral cells and bring it into the circulation and filter and inject that water into vital cells. And that's called reverse osmosis. And then you've got osmotic movement of water, because once insulin opens the gates and sugar goes in, and the mechanism is such that the other amino acids will go in, and they will carry some water with them into the cell for, to perform the functions of, of, uh, that are required. And as we grow older, we lose our perception of thirst, and the body becomes dehydrated. And if we make the stupid assumption that any fluid is good enough as in, in place of water, then we dehydrate the body even further, and that is how, in this area, diseases occur. 
This is a process of reverse osmosis. For example, brain cells, it's 85% water, needs water vitally because all its neurotransmission mechanisms depend on energy from water. Its flow mechanisms need water. So there is a substance, uh, I call it a neurotransmitter, or some people call it a hormone, uh, sits on its receptor and converts it into a shower head with tiny perforations of two angstrom units that only allow one water molecule to go through the holes, single file. No elements will go in, no other elements that are dissolved in the water that's in circulation. Only water will go through. Vasopressin also puts, as, as the, its name implies, it puts a pressure on the capillaries in the area and produces a constriction force to squirt water into the cell. When we become dehydrated, more and more we depend on this and the constrictive force. As a result, we shut down the capillary systems, and that is how hypertension begins, peripheral resistance because of dehydration and this method of water delivery. So when the body has to resort onto reverse osmosis as a means of delivering water into the cells, it uh, has to up the pressure, the injection pressure, more and more, and that's how we become susceptible to a rise in blood pressure. It has been shown scientifically that uh, between the ages of 20 and 70, the ratio of water content inside the cells to water volume outside of the cells changes drastically from 1.1 and becomes 0.8 less water inside the cells than outside of the cells. The cells at the age of 70 are shrunken, small. At the age of 20, they are more juicy. They are more plum-like. Here, they're prune-like. The water has been sucked out because of dehydration that is settled in the body. And somebody was, had to sacrifice its water content. And that is what happens. Don't forget, we are a satellite species that is in space travel. If we don't recognize our thirst and, and uh, satisfy it, the body assumes that it's going through a dry patch of space and is not replacing its water, is not able to replace its water content. This is a drastic change, and this is where disease occurs. Because don't forget, when we drink water, it goes inside the cells. Don't you remember that? So by not drinking water, we are producing this state, and that's why we are causing a disease state in the body. I don't expect you to read this, but let me explain it to you. When I researched uh, water in cure of peptic ulcer disease, and after treating 3,000 or more cases, I realized that these people were thirsty, and we have labeled thirst as a disease condition. I needed to find out why. All of a sudden, it occurred to me that the pharmaceutical industry insists on blocking the action of histamine in peptic ulcer disease. That's why they've got H2 blockers. And uh, such as Tagamet and Zantag. Why are they doing this? I said. And I started researching. Immediately I discovered that histamine is the main neurotransmitter in charge of water regulation and drought management programs of the body. So, whatever action histamine is taking in the body, it is to cope with drought. So, whatever symptoms it's producing are symptoms of dehydration and drought. That was a breakthrough in my work, and that is what I presented at the anti-cancer conference in 1987. And I explained that dehydration is the origin of pain and disease, including cancer. And when I made that presentation, uh, and they published it in this journal. I was invited by Scientific uh, Secretariat of the Third Interscience World Conference on Inflammation 
to present this view of histamine at their conference in 1989. I went there and this is what I produced, that histamine is a neurotransmitter in charge of water regulation of the body, and we should not treat dehydration with medications, but with water, because water is the best natural antihistamine there is, and salt is the best natural antihistamine. So whatever I'm explaining to you in this lecture has been presented at various conferences and international gatherings. There are three different histamine producing cells, basically. Uh, as a neurotransmitter, the, the brain cells, some aspects of the brain cells are producing histamine. Uh, then we have the mast cells, and then we have basophils that uh, circulate. Mast cells are basically uh, stationary uh, histamine producing cells and the uh, basophils are the ones that circulate in blood. But be by the virtue of possessing histamine-producing properties, they're all to be considered as neurons, and as brain cells or extensions of brain cells. So mast cells become brain cells locally, uh, and it has been shown that uh, also nerve grows towards them. So in other words, <coughs> they're connected to a nervous uh, system in the tissues. And then you've got the basophils that circulate. Water and salt are the best natural antihistamines. Not that we want to get rid of histamine, but we want to uh, allay its anxiety that there is no uh, water in the body so that it doesn't overreact because histamine can become very uh, insistent. It, has, it is a ruthless neurotransmitter uh, because uh, survival depends on a, a very strict rationing system, and histamine exercises that strict rationing system in the body when it's dehydrated. Histamine is uh, with us from minute one of life. This is a just fertilized ovum before it divides into two daughter cells in order to become two new cells that give life to a human body. This cell has got histamine releasing properties. So histamine is a very important element in, in, in our lives from minute one of life. It regulates the cation exchange in the cell. It liberates energy for cation exchange. When water is not around, it brings circulation to the area in order for the cell to expand 75% of its volume in water before it can divide. Between the ages of uh, minute one to nine months, histamine regulates and with growth hormone and, and mother's uh, hormones, regulates the water intake of the cell uh, and, of course, placental hormones. And after childbirth, growth hormone and histamine. And at the age of 25 onwards, we lose growth hormone, but histamine is still active. We gradually lose growth hormone. And uh, we lose our perception of thirst because of our lifestyle problems. And we gradually become dehydrated because there isn't a growth hormone there. But if we stimulate, if we take water on a regular basis and stimulate a tri tryptophan transport across the blood-brain barrier and manufacture serotonin, growth hormone is directly under the influence of serotonin. So growth hormone production will continue as long as we are hydrated. So what is the message of all this? It's persistent dehydration that causes pain and disease in the human body. Persistent and intentional dehydration reveals itself in as many ways as we in medicine have labeled as disease conditions. The new medical truth is you're not sick, you're thirsty. Don't treat thirst with medication. Now the question arises, if someone had just arrived and hadn't heard me talking, and, uh, or they were stuck on a question that's been bothering them for some time, how come water and salt act as medication in so many health problems? The answer is because they correct persistent dehydration inside all cells of the body. In dehydration, by the way, these are slides that were permission was given to me to use by Elan Sun Star from Hawaii. They're magnificent slides of water 
And uh, this artist is focused on water for some time and produced a lot of good slides. And he's, I've been given permission to use them in this capacity. Uh, most important amino acids are used as antioxidants in dehydration. You've seen these field uh, johns or, or the uh, toilet in, on, on board the planes. When there isn't water, they use these chemicals to deodorize and sanitize the refuse that enters the, into the thing when there is no drainage system. Field John is the same. In the human body, when there isn't enough water to wash the toxic waste away and carry it away from the interior of the cells and exterior of or, uh, environment of uh, important cells, something has to neutralize this toxic waste. The human body has learned to waste some of its own elements, tryptophan, tyrosine, methionines, cysteine, and histidine become depleted as a result of dehydration, because some of these are used as antioxidants. They neutralize, the, uh, they take the brunt of the acidity and the, and the chemical toxic, molecular toxic waste. Now, we come to the importance of salt, because we talked about water in the, in the cell, uh, inside the cells. Now, salt has to be there in order to expand the volume of water outside of the cells. And it has many functions. It is involved in nerve cell communication. Sodium potassium pump is involved in transmission of uh, messages across throughout the body in, in the nerve uh, pathways. It is vital for absorption of food. The sodium potassium pump is vital for absorption of all the food elements. It uh, clears lungs. It hydrates the lung tissue. It charge shields mucus, and mucus becomes watery and becomes much easier to get rid of. Prevents uh, muscle cramps because it takes the acid out of the cells, uh, muscle cells. Also, because it expands the circulation to the muscles, and the toxic waste can be washed away. So, it is vital for cramps. Uh, it is vital for maintaining the structure of bone, because when salt is there, it, the body manufactures hydroelectricity and doesn't need to tap into the calcium bondage in the bone structure. Not only that, but bone is a reservoir for salt. It is, in fact, the salt crystals, 27% of the reserves of the salt of the body is stored in the bones. Uh, it is salt crystal that gives bone its firmness and hardness. In other words, osteoporosis and osteoarthritis eventually is caused by salt deficiency as we come. Salt is vital for sleep. Anytime you can't sleep, if you drink a glass of water and put a tiny pinch of salt on your tongue, you will fall into a baby's sleep for at least four hours without any problem. I had an experience so that you don't uh, think that this is a very recent thing. Uh, in 1963, I went on pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, I, I, was I was brought up as a Muslim, but I believe in all religions, so I'm faithful to all of them. Because um, I believe in God and they're all his teaching, they carry his teaching. Uh, Saudi Arabian government was reluctant to release the plane that were, had uh, 180 people on board. They kept it on the tarmac in that hot environment for four hours. Uh, three hours into that delay, because don't forget we were there 18 days in the heat and we were all dehydrated as a result. Four, three hours into this delay, all of a sudden I heard someone shrieking, oh my heart, oh my heart. And uh, there was a doctor on board, uh, said, uh, called the stewardess and said, that, please uh, uh, tell them that, that there is a sick person, they should send an ambulance. I immediately realized instinctively what had happened. Uh, so I, there was, containers with lemonade. I went and 
got a whole lot of salt and filled the whole glass with lemonade and added a lot of salt to it, shook it and gave it to him to drink. And he drank it and within three minutes there, were, there was no more pain. What had happened, because we were sitting still, the only part of his body that was moving was his chest cavity in breathing. He had had the cramp of the intercostal muscles because of salt deficiency. We had sweated a lot of salt out of our bodies. And once I had replaced this uh, water and salt in the form of lemonade, that cramp went away. So salt deficiency is a very significant um, differential diagnostic uh, issue in a lot of heart problems. A lot of these all of a sudden pains may be produced by dehydration, as I have experienced. Uh, I treated a person with three glasses of water when his pain had begun at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon after lunch. When I saw him, it was 11 o'clock. Uh, he was in, in real, almost semi-comatose state from pain. And he wouldn't respond, I shook him, and I said, what's the problem? He said, my peptic ulcer disease is killing me. I said, what have you done for it? He said he had taken three tablets of Tagamet and a whole bottle of antacid and nothing had worked. So when I gave him two glasses of water, within 10 minutes he, he started calming down. I gave him a third glass of water within another six minutes. Within 20 minutes he was totally pain free. So dehydration can mimic surgical complications or uh, problems of surgical nature because normally this person would have been rushed in, a, in, in America or in Britain, he would have been rushed to the hospital and they would have opened him up to see what's happened. And of course they wouldn't have found anything because he was only thirsty. <laughs> Salt is vital in taking, extracting acidity out of the cells. In cation exchange, what happens? Sodium goes into the cell and hydrogen ion comes out. This is a silent activity. Then potassium goes into the cell and sodium comes out. So this is a cation exchange mechanism that you need salt in order to extract excess acid out of the interior of the cells and reduce or rather uh, take the acidity out and make the internal environment of the cell alkaline. Brain cells perform this function by having a lot of salt in their environment because cerebrospinal fluid is no less than a very salty ocean of water around the brain. Salt is essential for balancing blood sugar. The, osmotically, when there isn't enough salt, the design of the body is such that its sugar level goes up in order to osmotically draw water out of the cells and make it available for the brain because the brain doesn't need insulin in order to metabolize the excess sugar and water is essential for hydroelectric energy. Salt is vital for essential absorption of essential minerals. When we are short of salt, means we don't break salt down into sodium and chlorine or chloride in order to manufacture sodium bicarbonate, which is a acid neutralizer, and hydrochloric acid, which is poured in the stomach. Hydrochloric acid is vital for absorption of the essential minerals. Zinc, magnesium, manganese, selenium, copper, chromium, and molybdenum in that order depend on acidity inside the stomach in order to get absorbed. So in other words, salt deficiency can directly cause mineral deficiency. That's why a lot of people in dehydration are both zinc deficient, magnesium deficient, and selenium deficient, and a lot of impotence is probably caused by this guy not being available as a result of salt deficiency. Water is vital. Salt and water are, are vital elements for uh, integrity of the brain function. 
Uh, as you know, 85% water, the brain is. And all transport systems in the, in the nervous tissue are carried in microstreams. Uh, there is a better slide that this will come. So dehydration is responsible for loss of essential amino acids and minerals, which are the, ultimately the cause of a whole lot of neurological disorders and brain damage. This is a, a single nerve in, in a large bundle. It has microtubes. Microtubes are perforated cation pumps that are stuck together side by side. These microtubes act as drainage pipes in the cytoplasm that is, has got organized water. So it draws water and creates an area of lower viscosity. And the transporter protein moves on the microtubes that generates hydroelectric energy for transfer of this vesicle of products which have been manufactured in the nerve cell itself but has to be carried all the way down to the extreme nerve endings. Some of these elements are in, on passage for months before they reach their destination. And yet this is called the fast axon transport system. Uh, that is how water is vital for nerve transmission. You need to have the raw materials in position to perform a function. In dehydration, you deplete the raw materials that are required. And that's why people tire much more easily when they are dehydrated. In dehydration and associated achlorhydria, zinc, magnesium, manganese, and selenium are the elements that become depleted. Multiple sclerosis, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and others strongly reflect some of these mineral and amino acid deficiencies. So dehydration and salt deficiency are primary elements that are required in order to prevent neurological disorders. If you want your parents, yourselves, not to suffer later on in life from Alzheimer's disease, remember water and salt is probably the better medications for you, preventive medications, than anything you can imagine. And they're cheap, don't cost anything. Now, salt is vital for bladder control. How many of you know people who are truly uh, incapacitated because they can't hold their urine, they always have to wear pads? Well, salt is probably the missing element because a lot of people drink a lot of beverages that dehydrate the body and get rid of the salt. And salt is essential for smooth muscle to become strong. This is a lady uh, whose letter is in my book, ABC of Asthma, Allergies, and Lupus. Her name is Dotley Reed. She is a poetess. She's a very uh, intelligent person. She delivers uh, spare parts, eight hours sits in the car, and moves from one uh, service station to another, delivers spare parts. She always had to carry three changes of clothes in with her because she knew that she would need them. She had no control over her bladder. She would leak. And she came across my information on salt and started uh, increasing her salt intake. And within three or four days, she noticed the difference. Within eight days, she was totally dry. And this is her quotation from the book. She says, I have a weak bladder and had even taken spare clothing as I was sure they would be needed. I arrived with not a drop of anything on my clothing. I had talked myself off salt, a bad mistake. It's a bad, sad experience that 15, probably, what, 15 million people have that? I understand that there are this number of people who have this problem and bear it with a lot of uh, grace, but unfortunately they are suffering. So salt is a vital element. We come to the gist of what I had experienced in the prison 
because in prison we were all stressed and we didn't have activity, we, didn't, we were not able to move, we didn't have a, a proper environment of health. So I tried to find out what is, what is the connection to dehydration. Then I realized that uh, in, in stress, vasopressin is secreted, which I explained is a transmitter, neurotransmitter or hormone that uh, operates the reverse osmosis program. Then we produce endorphin, which allows us to endure hardship during our stress. Then we produce prolactin, because prolactin is the element that is needed by the body in, in the reproductive period, phase of life in order to keep uh, reproductive organs functioning. And then we produce cortisone release factor, because cortisone release factor is essential for mobilization of uh, raw materials from the interior of the body when it's not arriving as a result of uh, water intake and uh, absorption of food. Then we also produce renin-angiotensin uh, activity which regulates the blood volumes and the, and the vascular system volumes, uh, which is actually uh, directly responsible for uh, absorbing more salt or getting more salt and developing a salt appetite. As a result of my research and my understanding the relationship between histamine, <coughs> hydration, histamine production to renin-angiotensin system activation and vasopressin and prostaglandin production define the following conditions as the primary indicators of or consequences of chronic dehydration. This is, this is not a leap of faith, it's an actual fact that when you are dehydrated, those elements become secreted, and this relationship, uh, because of our knowledge of medicine, have to be assumed to be uh, produced by dehydration. Dehydration manifests itself in the body by four different ways. The perceptive feelings that everyone, the brain becomes aware of dehydration first and produces its own markers of dehydration which we never understood. Then water rationing programs are the next indicators. And then we have crisis calls of the body for water and disease complications. These four stages of dehydration in the body are now understandable. We need to become uh, more aware of them as we go along and if we come across people who have these problems, we can tell them easily that they're not sick, they're just thirsty, go and hydrate the body. Feeling tired is a sign of dehydration. When you haven't done a good day's work and you're tired, first thing in the morning you wake up, you're tired, you have no energy to get out of bed, you're dehydrated. Why, for eight hours you've slept, you've uh, respired water out of your body because every, everybody loses about a quart of water through breathing water evaporates and leaves your body through the lungs. And uh, you've perspired under the bedclothes and you haven't drank enough water for eight hours but you've manufactured urine which is sitting in your bladder. So you're truly dehydrated by the morning and in your brain cells when they need energy of hydroelectric energy to be vibrant and alive, they don't have it. So you get tired and necessarily first thing in the morning or throughout the day when you're active and you, it's not a high intensity activity and yet you get tired. That's a sign of dehydration. Water is a better pick-me-up than anything you can imagine. Feeling flushed, again, the vascular system to the face stems from the same uh, route as goes to the brain. So when vascular system in the brain is being opened up, nonetheless the vascular system to the face will also open up. Because face is the extension of your brain, All the, your face is not just the, the, the nose, two eyes and the mouth and, and your two ears, but it's full of nerve endings. Your face is in fact a receptor dish that's connected to your brain and it reads its environment constantly. And so it needs more circulation to be integrated with the brain activity. 
when, when there is dehydration uh, and the brain recognizes that dehydration, it also brings a more circulation to the face because those are the extensions of its activity. Being irritable again, uh, I've explained these in the book, you can read those. Uh, being anxious, being dejected, these are all consequences of not having enough energy for brain function. And uh, depression is another sign of dehydration because not only you become depressed by energy loss, but you also become depressed because you lose the amino acids such as tryptophan and tyrosine, which are supposed to revitalize your brain function. Uh, you lose serotonin level in the brain, and that's why a lot of people who are depressed have low serotonin level as a result of losing tryptophan. And also water is vital for tryptophan to go across the blood-brain barrier when in dehydration uh, the, the, its competitors go across the blood-brain barrier. Feeling having a heavy head and not a headache, that's a sign of dehydration. Cravings, alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, dehydration cravings. You need to increase water intake and you can kick off any habit. Then we have the water drought management programs of the body, asthma, allergies, hypertension, old age diabetes, and autoimmune disease. These are all signs that the body is in crisis, drought and resource management. One of the areas where drought management hits us in our society is asthma. It affects 17 million people, 15 million children suffer from asthma because lungs are where you lose water. Uh, lung tissue can become very dried up when you take rush wind into the lungs and rush wind plus all the vo water vapor that can leave out of the lungs. And unless there is water coming from the base to rehydrate the lung tissue, the lung tissue, which is very delicate, and uh, these air sacs are very thin membranes, could immediately become uh, dried up and brittle, very much like uh, washings that you put on the, on the line in order to dry them up in the wind. The lung tissue can get dried up. So the, the body cannot allow the lung tissue to be damaged as, because you are not drinking enough water. In fact, you should drink some water right now. <laughs> that water is no good in the bottle. It should be inside you. <laughs> so the lung tissue shuts down. Histamine is the regulator. It shuts the bronchioles down in children because the bronchioles are very delicate and, and they're, they haven't developed the cartilage structure yet to, uh, to be firm. They tighten much more quickly. And that's why 15 million children suffer from asthma. And every year, many thousands of these people die because of the ruthless, ruthless action of histamine that it does not understand that this action will kill the person. It's been trying to tell that person for some time that you are dehydrated. That's why the, initially there is a cough in, in asthma, <coughs> not being able to breathe properly, and then you continue to run, eat, and without hydrating the body, and eventually uh, you, you precipitate an asthma attack. Whereas if with the initial cough of asthma, people begin to drink water, that cough will go and asthma attack will be aborted. In fact, as soon as there is shortness of breath uh, with asthma, a glass or two of water straight away and a tiny pinch of salt on the tongue will abort an asthma attack much better than any of these inhalers. Hypertension, 66% of the water loss is from inside the cells, 26% is from outside of the cells, and only 8% is from the vascular system. But the vascular system tightens up, it closes its capillaries, and that's why we develop a resistance effect in hypertension. Um, but that 66% water loss is the damaging factor. In hypertension, there is reverse osmosis program going on, and that's what hypertension is all about. When the resistance increases, more force has to be brought 
to bear in order to force the water into the cells. And this drought management program and reverse osmosis is what the body is engaged in. We need to facilitate it by giving it more water and giving it more salt to expand the ocean of water outside of the cells so that this reverse osmosis program can take place much more easily in the meantime until we build up enough water that it can go through the cell by process of diffusion. Pancreas is another water distribution organ. It produces watery bicarbonate solution and injects it into the first part of the duodenum in order to neutralize the acid that comes out of the stomach. Pancreas also produces insulin that opens the gates and sugar can move into the cells and as a result carry the other amino acids and water. This is a, an embarrassing situation when the body is short of water. So the mechanism that brings water to the pancreas in order to manufacture a watery bicarbonate solution more and more will shut down the insulin producing mechanism. In other words, prostaglandin E, which is the main subordinate water regulator to histamine, uh, gets engaged nonstop in bringing more circulation to the pancreas will shut down insulin production. So old age diabetes or type 2 diabetes is a condition of dehydration of the body. Once we begin to increase water intake and salt intake, we can reverse that. We can cure diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes, which is a, uh, the mechanism that goes beyond it, becomes an autoimmune disease, as I will explain. Uh, Insulin-producing cells are destroyed. Uh, this condition, too, will benefit by increased water intake. The need for insulin will decrease drastically, and we prevent the uh, secondary damage of dehydration, such as uh, vascular damage and retinopathies and things like that. So these things will disappear. They will not occur because they are secondary damage produced by dehydration. Autoimmune diseases are insulin-dependent diabetes, just I explained. Neurological disorders such as multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, lupus, muscular dystrophy, chronic fatigue, Hashimoto's disease, a whole lot of other conditions are produced as a result of a cycle that begins to, uh, to establish in an area. The damage of dehydration occurs when cortisone begins to secrete a lot of interleukin-1 and depresses interleukin-2 production, which are two elements that the white cells produce uh, in circulation in order to regulate their subordinate actions. Interleukin-2 stimulates immune system and interferon production, which are the defense mechanisms against uh, bacteria and cancer and a whole lot of other things. In dehydration, to the point that we have to rely on cortisone activity, this element becomes uh, destroyed uh, or suppressed. Interleukin-1 is responsible for mobilization of elements from the body tissues themselves. This is a slide uh, that uh, I need to explain to you. Vasopressin that I showed you earlier is a cortisone release factor. It's a very strong cortisone release factor. It's a modulating cortisone release factor. Co when dehydration occurs in the body and vasopressin becomes more and more active, vasopressin produces cortisone release factor and cortisone release factor stimulates interleukin-1 production. And this becomes a vicious circle. More and more occurs. At a certain level, a substance called interleukin-6 and another one, tumor necrosis factor, are secreted. These are the elements that gut take cells out of the system. They break them down. They fragment the interior of the cells and the nucleus is broken down into segments that are refloated into the system uh, and picked up by other tissues as primary raw materials that have already been uh, uh, manufactured in one or another capacity. It's like 
uh, when a car is broken down, there, you take the carburetor of one car and put it in another car. The, these elements that are broken from the DNA are being used in other capacities. Now, interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor stimulate proteases in the body, and this is a part of the remanufacturing process. But if it gets stuck on the job with dehydration, it continues to the point of producing DNA damage and RNA damage and fragmenting more and more cells. At a certain level of fragmentation, the segments of the DNA that are produced or RNA that are produced have unfortunately been labeled as viruses, slow viruses, such as HIV, such as Coxsackie virus in chronic fatigue. In AIDS, when they cult cultured the cells that are producing AIDS, they gave the cells interleukin-6 extensively and harvested the virus. So they were fragmenting the DNA. That's what interleukin-6 does. It does it actually in insulin uh, breaking down the beta cells, interleukin-6 breaks down the beta cells and produces the type 1 diabetes. <clears throat> now, in HIV commercialization, they don't say that they produce the virus with interleukin-6. But in the culture medium, when they gave these cells, one of the essential amino acids that I showed you that become deficient they gave these culture cells cysteine. These cells didn't produce any more virus. So HIV virus is produced when the cell is deficient on, of an element, such as cysteine and zinc. Now, they have converted this half science into a money-making and people-killing process we call AIDS research. We take this exactly the same problem to Africa, and we say a whole continent of Africa suffers from AIDS, not realizing that drought in Africa, food shortage in Africa, is the primary cause of the problem, because AIDS is a metabolic disorder. It's not a viral disease. I've said that a long time ago. I've said it in scientific language. I've explained this process in scientific language. And the section is in my book, uh, Your Body's Many Cries for Water. It is on my website, watercure.com, so that the world will know AIDS is a fraud. Position on AIDS is a fraud. The pharmaceutical industry is perpetrating fraud against society. And scientists are allowing it because they don't think. They buy whatever pharmaceutical industry says, hook, like, and sinker. Now, these slow viruses occur as a result of resource deficiencies. If we correct the metabolic problem, initially dehydration, subsequently the minerals that are deficient, and, and eventually the amino acids that are the building blocks of cell activity, then we can correct these disease conditions. The emergency calls of the body are early morning sickness of pregnancy, dyspeptic pain, migraine, headaches, angina, rheumatoid joint pain, back pain, uh, intermittent leg pain, colitis pain, and fibromyalgic pain. Pain occurs in the body when the body becomes acid. If you've got a urine that is light yellow, urine should be actually colorless, almost colorless, but up to light yellow is acceptable. But when it becomes orange, then your body is getting acid. You need a pH of 7.3 to 7.1 in the blood and 7.4 in the, in the, inside the cells. When you alter this by dehydration, not drinking enough water to wash the acid out of the body, and the interior of the cells become 
uh, acidic. You don't have enough sodium to take the acidity out of the cell. Then you build up the acid, which damages the DNA. So this is a primary problem. But before this occurs, acid converts precalicrine to kinine inside the cells. Kinine is a pain producer. When the body becomes acid, you produce more kinines in the cells. Nerve endings in the environment where you have high acidity register this chemical environmental change with the brain, and the brain registers it with our conscious mind in form of pain, meaning pain is a sign of high acidity when there hasn't been enough water in circulation to wash the toxic waste away. That's why pain is a limiting factor. It's telling us, don't create more acid. Go and drink water. Let it circulate. Let it wash the toxic waste out of the environment. And then once the pain subsides, then it means that your body is OK. You can use it. This is what pain means, high acidity in the body. This is an alkaline level. When the body becomes more and more acid, the interior of the cells become acid. And some of these may be nerve endings. And they register this with the brain in form of pain. And the brain translates the information for the conscious mind in form of pain. There are two components to pain. One is the pain that is, can be dealt with locally. When you take uh, one of these painkillers, you prevent prostaglandin and kinin formation, which are the pain-producing elements that are subordinate to histamine. But there is also a central nervous system pain that directly signals pain. And these painkillers cannot get at the central nervous system pain. That's what happened to the guy that I treated after 10 hours of pain with water when none of these pain medications had worked on him. He was suffering from his central nervous system mechanism of pain production. That's why a lot of these people who are on painkillers gradually become uh, less sensitive to the medication. And that's why the doctor has to change and change and change, but never work. And there are 110 million Americans who suffer from pain of one kind or another. And uh, they don't realize that they are, they've been dehydrated all this time. Pain killers cut the connection between prostaglandin and kinin and platelet activating factor. And uh, these, this is a water regulator, but it also regulates completion of cell maturity. So dehydration plus painkillers makes the body susceptible to cancer cell formations, producing immature cells. So Long-term use of painkillers is dangerous. Anginal pain, even though the heart circulates all the blood, Nonetheless, the heart muscle itself could become dehydrated to the point of producing pain. But the mechanism is a little more complicated than that. When we eat and we don't drink enough water, gastrointestinal tract deals with the situation, borrows water from here and there to the best of its ability, and produces a concentrated form of uh, digestive juices that enter the, the blood, uh, di digestive products that enter the blood and go to the liver, and the liver pumps it uh, eventually through the portal circulation to the right side of the heart, and the, and the heart pumps it into the lung tissue. And the lung tissue, because of its nature, will absorb a little more uh, water that's not there and makes, makes the blood even more concentrated. But the lung tissue in the process is now beginning to sense dehydration and is producing constrictive chemicals. <coughs> These constrictive chemicals, if they spill over into the circulation and go to the left side of the heart, they will have exactly the same impact on the vascular system of the heart and produce a spasm of the, of the coronary artery. And this, in my opinion, is the cause of pain. That is the cause of anginal pain. But also, this concentrated blood will begin to draw a lot of water out of the 
membrane uh, cells. And because of its nature of rushing and uh, pumping action and the abrasive action of concentrated blood and acidic blo blood that's damaging the tissue, circulation in the coronary arteries becomes hazardous to the membrane because it produces tiny abrasions and tears. And unless something covers up these abrasions and tears, what, uh, the blood will find a lip in one of these tears and peel the membrane off and throw it as an embolus. So the design of the body is such that cholesterol is designed to come and cover up that abrasion straight away and smoothen over it. It makes it waterproof so that no more water will be lost uh, to the blood. And, uh, and, and this low-density cholesterol that does this is actually saving your life. There is no such thing as bad cholesterol. The body does not make bad cholesterol or bad elements. That's hazardous to its own survival. The medical community doesn't understand this and buys into the slogan of bad cholesterol and the pharmaceutical industry's uh, fraudulent uh, use of society as cash cows for its products is pushing the use of cholesterol-lowering medications. They fail to explain to the society that we measure the level of cholesterol in the body in the blood that we take out of the veins of the body. And nowhere in the history of medicine is there a record of cholesterol ever having blocked the veins of the body. So if this bad material was going to spill over and stick to the walls and block the system, it should do so more readily in the veins because the vein flow is a float mechanism. It flows upwards. It's not, it, it's not pumped. And in this situation, the cholesterol would be able to stick to the wall more readily, but it doesn't. So that is not the function of cholesterol. Cholesterol is saving our lives by being the grease gauze, the adhesive bandage that sticks to the tears and wears and tears of the arterial system that are produced by concentrated acidic blood that rushes through these elements. So beware, cholesterol-lowering medications are dangerous. They are not helping you. Uh, they're in fact causing a lot of liver damage. A lot of people are now suffering from liver problems as a result of buying into the idea that cholesterol-lowering medications are essential for you. Joints, another one. Cartilage retains a lot of salt. It needs a lot of salt in order to keep water. Water is the lubricant in the joint. Normally, water comes through the bone marrow, but when there is dehydration, the bone marrow takes priority. It doesn't allow the water to diffuse through the uh, bone marrow into the cartilage area and wear and tear in the, uh, in, uh, by using the joint that's uh, dehydrated will produce the osteoarthritic level of damage in the joint. So water and salt are the better medications for arthritic problems because salt is vital for cartilage cartilage and the discs of the back spinal column retain a lot of salt in their structure and maintain a lot of water and that's why they, these elements are not only uh, the lubricants but they are the shock absorbing elements. Now complications of dehydration, uh, raised cholesterol that I explained, heart failure that I tried to explain, chronic fatigue that I did try to explain. Cancers, multiple sclerosis, osteoarthritis, and, and so on and so on. Cholesterol, I explained, becomes the adhesive material that sticks the cell together. If cholesterol wasn't there, this, this cell would, would die very quickly. It will disintegrate. Cholesterol has other functions. It uh, converts to, uh, under the uh, influence of sunlight, it converts to vitamin D. Vitamin D goes through the cell membrane on its receptor 
its tail sticks out, calcium sticks to the tail of the vitamin D, and all the other elements stick to the, uh, to the tail of the calcium, and the whole thing is taken in as a train, as a food train. So cholesterol is a vital element in the human body as a mechanism of converting sunlight to, uh, within the food uh, metabolism of the body. So sunlight is absolutely essential. So people who've got uh, high cholesterol, it means that they're actually low in en energy level. They need to go out in the sunlight and get a little more of their cholesterol converted to, to uh, vitamin D and uh, enhance their food chain uh, activity. By the way, cholesterol is also the element from which all the hormones are made. Cholesterol is the element that the body uses as an insulating membrane on all its nervous tissue. So cholesterol has got a monumental role in the human body. There is absolutely no such thing as bad cholesterol. The idiots who use it should be hanged. <laughs> Cancer. Uh, as I explained, uh, I presented at the cancer conference the explanation that the cancer in the body is produced by dehydration. And water and salt are better medications for cancer than uh, anything you can imagine. Cancer cells are primitive cells, genetically selfish. In other words, they're, the, they're unsophisticated cells. Through our cultural development, cells of the body have learned to perform a, a role within a capacity of function. Uh, as we become dehydrated, we, uh, we reduce that uh, integration of activity, and gradually we force cancers, uh, we force cells to become immature and primitive. Uh, they live in an aerobic environment and low oxygen needs. If oxygen re reaches cancer cells, it'll kill them. And uh, that's why they've been trying to uh, treat cancer with hyperbaric oxygen, things like that. But the best way is to increase water intake. It will take oxygen to the cancer cells. Uh, cancer cells in culture reveal stem cell properties. In other words, if they, they don't have to go and take fetal tissue, they can take can cancer tissue and produce stem cells. In, in, uh, in, in cell cultures, if they uh, don't give the right deficiencies to the cancer cell, it'll, uh, it'll immediately become a stem cell. In order to uh, produce cancer, uh, we need four things that m must uh, not be there, or it's a multi-system dysfunction. First and foremost, DNA damage, as I explained. Then we have got a repair mechanism that is deficient. Then we've got receptor down regulation because the cancer cell becomes primitive, and then the immune system suppression. DNA damage is produced by excess acidity in the cell. You've seen these monuments, stone monuments, when pigeons sat on them and the pigeon droppings deface the monuments, the acid ate into the, into the stone. Now, uh, our cells are less hard than the, uh, than the stone. They get more readily damaged by the hydrogen ion uh, that is uh, produced in the acid environment inside the cell. So there is DNA damage as a result of dehydration. The tripod lysine, tryptophan lysine, is the enzyme that recognizes DNA uh, damage and tra transcription disc indiscretions and cells that are not normally integrated into the system and cuts and splices and uh, uh, repairs the DNA damage, this, this enzyme system. Now, in dehydration, we lose tryptophan because it's used as a and antioxidant. We lose a whole lot of amino acids that uh, in dehydration are sacrificed. So the DNA repair mechanism becomes damaged as a result of dehydration because the elements that should be there are used in another capacity. Then another problem is autonomy of the cell. Histamine produces a lot of calcium release, as I explained, that calcium is being used as an as a energy source. And individual calciums stimulate protease activity in the cell membranes. 
and protease activity uh, produces converts uh, protein kinase C, which is a normal, well-functioning and integrated normal cell and uses protein kinase C for its activities. Proteases destroy this and convert it into a protein kinase M, which is a much smaller protease that manufactures protein. And uh, this, unfortunately, is an autonomous protein kinase. It doesn't obey commands from outside. Stop producing more of this. The cell doesn't recognize its boundaries. The, it doesn't have any inhibitory actions on it. It constantly begins to replicate. And this is unfortunately as a result of excess calcium activity in, in, the, in the cells. Receptor downregulation, you know, I showed you earlier that all cells have got receptors in their fluid environment. They need that receptor in order to communicate. In dehydration and lack of resources, these receptors are not manufactured anymore. So the cells become, don't become integrated anymore. They are less integrated. And as a result of that, the cell becomes autonomous. There is no controlling mechanism to stop it from excess activity. Then we've got the interleukin-1 activity, which continues to break down tissues. Interleukin-2 activity is suppressed, which is vital as a mechanism of uh, defense. Interferon production is suppressed as a result of dehydration. So we have three of the elements that can cause cancer that are produced in dehydration. Andrew Bowman is a 42-year-old gentlemen, this is a very historic uh, case history. He is probably the first one that will show you how dehydration in the fourth dimension of time, dehydration that initially revealed itself in childhood and by the age of 40 produced a whole host of damage in the guy and eventually caused his problem. At the age of eight, he had allergies. By the age of 23, he had asthma. 14, he developed uh, diabetes, and he had neuro neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy at the age of 26. His immune system was suppressed and had many bouts of infectious mononucleosis or glandular fever. Eventually, he developed a, a lump in his, under his skin on the left side. Biopsy in 1995 showed lymphoma. Gallium test revealed lymphoma all over his body. He was glowing with lymphoma tissue. He searched high and low, eventually came to uh, Mr. Bob Butts, who lives in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, who is one of the uh, uh, guys who spent many hundreds of thousands of dollars of his own money in uh, spreading my information to the 600,000 community of Northeast Pennsylvania. He, uh, advised Andrew Bowman to uh, go on the water cure. In 95, he started the water cure. In March of 96, he went for a gallium test. There was no cancer tissue left anywhere. And he is now six years cancer-free. He's one of the guys who's going around and teaching a whole lot of people about dehydration and lymphoma. Breast tissue is the water fountain for the newborn, it has to be primed all the time. One of the things that keeps it primed is prolactin. As I explained, prolactin is a stress hormone. It's not a, in itself a stress hormone, but in stress it becomes more and more produced. It has been shown that prolactin activity can produce mammary tu uh, tumor in mice. Now, prolactin is activated, excess of it, in dehydration, stress, and aspartame, artificial sweetener, can cause prolactin increase, and that is why we develop cancer. In more and more of cancer in our society, not knowing that there is a connection between breast cancer that's rising in the society and consumption of diet sodas. This is Dr. Lorraine Day. I have got her permission to show this slide. Uh, you can go to her website, drday.com, and see the same thing. And she developed cancer of the breast, did a lumpectomy, but cancer was all over her body. She's a doctor of medicine herself, 
She was 15 years the head of orthopedic department of San Francisco General Hospital. She's a f magnificent doctor, a surgeon. But once she developed cancer, she realized that she's absolutely uh, no hope with her o orthodox or the method that they, she used to treat cancer herself because she had seen the result of chemotherapy, x-radiation, surgery, and whatever, and cancer was never cured that way. So this, she decided to go into alternative medicine. She started taking a lot of uh, vegetables and changing her lifestyle, gave up medicine. In fact, she was forced because she was, she became so sick that she was bedridden. She, all this time she was taking uh, alternative Route. Then someone sent her a copy of my book, and she read it, and all of a sudden the whole thing dawned on her why she had developed cancer. She started drinking her, increasing her water intake uh, to about 16 to 20 glasses of water a day, plus the diet. Within three or four or five days, she felt much better, and within three weeks she was able to get out of bed and walk, and she's never looked back. Her cancer has disappeared. She's, this is an old picture, uh, older picture of hers. She's now seven or eight years cancer-free. And this is her statement. Dr. Batman Yulich's discovery regarding water was critical to my recovery. I could not have recovered without it. Wells Jackson, uh, Air Force officer in Germany, develops in 1999 develops a routine test shows 4.6 PSA. Biopsy confirms that he has cancer of the prostate. Comes to Walter Reed in January of 2000. Biopsy by uh, PSA is by, by then 5.7. Walter Reed again tests him and they confirm tumor. He does not buy into the idea of chemotherapy and uh, uh, X radiation or seeding or surgery and opts for hydration in place of the January, his PSA came down to about 3.5 within three months. Then he went back onto his old lifestyle of drinking beer because he was in Germany, drinking a lot of coffee because he's got three coffee plantations and uh, PSA went up. I told him that he can't do that. He needs to make his body alkaline instead of acid. So he, he listened to me fortunately and within a month, his PSA came down again to 3.5, and he's been 3.5 when he was again re interviewed uh, or tested at Walter Reed, and he was totally cancer-free. He, he was told to go home and come back in a year's time with, without anything. So water and salt are better medications for cancer treatment than anything you can imagine. Why do we develop cancer of prostate? because prostate gland contains a lot of acid phosphatase, which is, a, which is a, uh, an enzyme system that uh, becomes stimulated in an acidic environment and produces more protein. So the prostate enlarges in acidic environment and eventually produces cancer in acidic environment. If people have got cancer of prostate, they need to make their body alkaline. Any form of cancer, you need to make your body alkaline. I will explain how to do that. Water is the best mechanism of making your body alkaline. It washes the acid out of the, out of the body. You manufacture urine, and urine will take a lot of acid out of it. In order to bring the acid, extract the acid out of the cells, you need salt. And I'm showing this salt shaker, but I don't really mean that you should take table salt. You need unrefined salt that contains all the other elements in it. There are 80, 82 elements in sea salt. The manufacturing companies wash these elements and sell them separately uh, at high prices and give you the sodium chloride, which is which doesn't serve the same capacity as uh, uh, all the other elements that are, should be in, in, in salt. But nonetheless, even, even in this capacity, this table salt is, uh, should be taken if, unless you've got the other kind of salt. 
uh, you need the other minerals, and you can get that, uh, those other minerals from fruits and vegetables. We need half the body weight in ounces of water. In other words, a 100-pound person needs 50 ounces of water. And for every 10 glasses of water, we need at least half a teaspoon of salt. Half a teaspoon of salt is 3 grams of salt, 3 to 4 grams, depending on the size of teaspoon. And the better uh, formula is a quarter teaspoon per quart of water in order to maintain the balance between the intracellular and extracellular fluid volume in the body. If we are active, we need more water, we need more salt because we perspire and respire and we get rid of salt. Uh, in hot climates, we need more water and salt. If we eat heavy food, we need more water and less salt because heavy food probably has, if you're eating meat and things like that, has a lot of salt in it. Uh, so please listen up. The best solution in life for maintenance of health is in adjustment of water and salt intake to the optimum level that your body requires. Anytime you feel tired, drink it glass of water, not anything else, because water is a better pick-me-up than anything you can imagine. And water will open up your brain function. Uh, your brain will function infinitely better under proper hydration than in dehydration. Three elements will bring you health. Adequate water intake and salt intake. You need daily exercise. Daily exercise is vital. Because your muscle movement regulates the physiology of your brain function. Very simply put, when you move your muscles, not only you recirculate the blood from your lower extremities, because your legs, the muscles of your legs are your secondary hearts. Your heart pumps the blood in your arterial system your calf muscles will pump the blood in your venous system. So you need to walk in order to bring circulation back to the heart. And also let the lymph flow. That's how the whole mechanism uh, takes place. And exercise has another function. When you use your muscles, you burn up nuisance amino acids, which are the branch chain amino acids. Valine, leucine, isoleucine, these are competitors to tryptophan and tyrosine for passage across the blood brain barrier. When you take these branch chain amino acids out of circulation by burning them in the muscle, you allow the tryptophan to go across the blood brain barrier more readily and easily and manufacture serotonin tryptamine, melatonin, and indolamine, which are the amino acids, and your tyrosine will, will go across the blood-brain barrier and manufacture your adrenaline, noradrenaline, and dopamine, which are vital elements against depression and so on. Water does another thing. Water by itself actually produces up to 90 minutes stimulation of the uh, sympathetic nervous system. Uh, which stimulates adrenaline, noradrenaline adrenaline activity, and fat-burning enzymes in the body are hormone-sensitive. In other words, adrenaline, noradrenaline stimulate the fat-burning enzymes in the, in, the, in the body, and you begin to metabolize fat as a source of energy. Exercise does that. After one hour of walking, your fat-burning enzymes become measurable. Hormone-sensitive lipase becomes measurable in your blood circulation up to 12 hours. So if you walk twice a day, you will have 24 hours activity of the hormone-sensitive lipase, which breaks down the fat in preference to anything else. So your muscle is conserved, your fat is burnt, and that's how the body begins to, uh, to energize itself. But in dehydration, you willy-nilly use up both muscle tissue as fodder for energy, as well as the fat. So walking is a very important element. And also, in, when you walk, you hydrate the spinal 
discs and your back pain will disappear, your body becomes upright, and also uh, breathing is essential part of walking because in breathing you make your body alkaline. Every time you, uh, you pass uh, carbon dioxide out of your body, you make your body alkaline. You also need, uh, in preference to anything else, you need a lot of vegetables because vegetables contain a lot of magnesium. Vegetables make your body alkaline. It is a rule that uh, you need 20% of your energy from an acid-making uh, system, such as a protein, meat, or poultry, or if you are meat eaters, and 80% from vegetables and fruits. And these guys, sodas, alcohol, coffee, and tea are no-nos for health. Thank you very much. I've worked in numerous nursing homes over the years, and I've seen a lot of patients with stroke and high blood pressure and um, a lot of di different ailments that I've heard that would the doctors would conf would um, probably consider what you're saying kind of controversial? Heresy. They wouldn't call it a contradiction. <laughs> They'll call it sacrilege. They'll say it's a, he's, a, he's a heretic. He should be quartered. He should be shot. He's, he's, yeah, he's robbing us from our income. <laughs> In addition to that, they've always said that high blood pressure is one of the silent killers of black people. And the idea of using salt, I, I'm one of those people who have a sort of a low salt diet. And I'm just curious, how much salt would be appropriate? The standard uh, requirement of the body is at least three to four grams of salt a day as a minimum because your body has a mechanism of retaining salt. Mm -hmm. But if you don't give it enough salt that it could retain, then your body can become salt deficient. Um, even, even cardiologists, and, uh, standard understanding is that salt is a, is a, a, more, a most important element. In fact, in the handout that I've given you, there is a, there is a recent report uh, published uh, from Albert Einstein School of Medicine, Dr. Michael Alderman, Chairman of the Epidemiology at Albert Einstein Un School of Medicine in New York and President of the American Society of Hypertension, suggests the government should consider suspending its recommendation that people <coughs> restrict the amount of salt they eat. This is the recent information. And in fact, it says that people who are on low salt diet are more prone to die from heart attacks and strokes than people who are on low salt, high salt, higher salt diet. You have a copy of this? Yes, I do. Thank you. Well, read it. That's, that's the information that you need because we are, there are a lot of us who are ignorant in medicine, but very, very vociferous in our ignorance. Uh, we. You know, when you've got a belief system, you stick to the belief system um, far more, uh, uh, how shall I say, emotionally than if you had intelligence. Because uh, in intelligence, you have to argue. In, in, uh, in belief system, you reject the information straight away. Well, so a lot, of doctors, a lot of doctors sense. are rejecting my information because they are acting on belief system. And memory that the pharmaceutical industry is installed or the brain has been programmed with. And if you've got a computer, you know that it only functions with the memory it's got and whatever program it's got. It cannot uh, accept anything new unless you install that material uh, intelligently in it. How does uh, increasing the body's free water content physiologically decrease uh, the craving for alcohol and cigarettes? Very simple, increasing your water content of your body. When, when, you are, when you've got cravings, you're secreting a lot of endorphins, okay? Your endorphins become satisfied infinitely better with water and salt than with the material that you're taking, the substances that you're taking. Very simple. It's a very simple mechanism. Um, 
uh, in fact, uh, there was a lady uh, who became an alcoholic and virtually uh, sank to the lower uh, the level of a gutter, you know, and completely drunk with children. Uh, and uh, he started, she started abusing her body and becoming abused by others. And her father gave her a copy of my book, and she had realized that she wants to change, and Walter managed to do that for her. And within, within a few weeks, she became totally non, uh, no cravings for alcohol, and she picked up her life, and now she's a very successful business lady without any problem. She, she got a, a car and took her children, went from Las Vegas back to California, and is now uh, very successful. If you like, we can send you a copy of the letter she, she wrote. Water and salt will cause uh, cravings to go because your body translates dehydration in a way that you have interpreted it as satisfying with something that will produce the endorphins. Okay, alcohol will dehydrate your body and produce a lot of endorphins. You become addicted to your own endorphins, whereas your endorphins should be should be stimulated by water and salt, which are the natural elements to your body. So you you virtually uh, select a substitute for endorphin secretion, but without correcting the problem, and that's how you gradually become uh, uh, deficient of so many things such as tryptophan, tyrosine, that you require in order to be an integrated person, to be, uh, uh, how shall I say, not aggressive but uh, purposeful. You need these elements. But in dehydration, you lose those elements, so you lose your sense of purpose. Dr. Pratap, it will be my pleasure to answer any question you've got. No, in your book, some place you have written regarding government is using some something for warfare. What is that? I'll repeat. Uh, he, uh, he is uh, he's referring to a research that has been done by uh, uh, a, f a doctor uh, and he's come to the conclusion that uh, ele electromagnetic uh, uh, wavelengths, energy pulses, are being uh, focused and beamed and uh, programmed to take over the brain's own electromagnetic uh, fields. And by doing so, the government can uh, influence the person into performing a, fun a function that would not be desirable. I've explained that in the book, ABC of Asthma, Allergies, and Lupus. Uh, that your face actually is a, a receptor dish and it constantly is tabulating information that it receives from its environment. Uh, but this is good information. The government has learned to use this portal of entry into the brain by producing pulsed energy <coughs> to overtake the body's physiological functions, for example. In fact, I had a talk with a, uh, with a military officer who was in charge of this. He said, yes, this is, a, uh, this is actually the, the case. We are using this as a non-lethal uh, battlefield uh, uh, means of uh, neutralizing the enemy soldiers. That's what they're doing. Uh, 
For example, the person will, will completely lose control of his or her bowels uh, or lose a volition to fight and would put down his gun and, and go away. Uh, in fact, uh, this gentleman, this doctor, thinks that they used it in, in a desert storm uh, and they incapacitated the uh, Saddam Hussein's imperial guards or, or guards revolutionary, what, what guards they call them anyway. Uh, and that's why we had no casualties. These people put down their guns and, and all of them uh, came out as, uh, with their hands up. This is, this is, a, this is a way the, the body can be used uh, and its normal functions over, overtaken for an ulterior motive and a purpose. Uh, there's a doctor by the name of Julia Ross who wrote a book on um, the diet cure. She's out in California. She's been using amino acids to help um, Indians on reservations become less addicted to the substances that they're addicted to. So yes. is there a need to increase your intake of amino acids while you're trying to balance out your diet, or is water and salt enough? No. That's why I explained that you need to uh, alter your metabolism. You, you need to take a lot of fruits and vegetables and, and proteins uh, in order to correct the imbalance that occurred as a result of dehydration. Mm -hmm. what? Uh, dehydration will first and foremost conserve the resources that you have in your body by the time that you have recognized dehydration. And then you need to supplement in order to fight the, uh, the deficiency, you have to correct the deficiency. Initially, the mineral deficiency, magnesium deficiency, and zinc deficiency, and selenium deficiency, manganese deficiency, and all these other metals that are go to manufacture the enzyme systems. And then you need the essential amino acids you know, as the building blocks. And so it would be good to take those and water and salt and then eventually move to the diet, get it from your food. I, I suggest that water and salt and food is a better order. Individual amino acids are useless, excuse my expression, uh, because the body has a, a guillotine system. It cannot have one peak off. It cuts the head off. Everything has to enter the system in a balanced proportion. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you take, give the body a lot of tryptophan, it's not good for you. Uh, you. You produce a whole lot of problems. If you give the body a lot of tyrosine, you produce aggression, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but a balanced, a balanced mechanism. For example, a lot of people talk about juicing. Okay, it is better to take the whole fruit than to juice it because it has all the other elements in it. Mm -hmm. So the best source of amino acids are? Uh, I have given a lot of explanation in this okay. book on the amino acids, eggs, the best source of amino eggs. acids. Don't be frightened of cholesterol. As Thank I explained, you. cholesterol has absolutely nothing to do with what goes on in your blood vessels. Uh, cholesterol is manufactured by the body the cholesterol that you take doesn't add up to the cholesterol that uh, you've got in your body. There are people who take 24 eggs a day and they don't have cholesterol. I eat a lot of eggs and I don't have cholesterol. Cholesterol is produced by dehydration in the body and low energy levels. So add up your energy level and you won't have any cholesterol problems. Learn more about restoring and maintaining your health with water by reading Dr. Batman Gelage's books. Your Body's Many Cries for Water, ABC of Asthma, Allergies, and Lupus, and How to Deal with Back Pain and Rheumatoid Joint Pain. These books contain vital information about water, salt, diet, and exercise, ingredients to vibrant health and well-being. Order them today.